Welcome to Season 3 of the Listen by Heart podcast, where we feature stories from women of the South China Sea. I'm Jasmine Lowe, and today I will be joined by Chua Guat Eng. Chua Guat Eng is a Malaysian novelist and professional writer. Her experience spans three fields of writing, commercial and corporate, academic and literary. She read English literature at University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur and German literature at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. In 2008, she received a PhD from the University Kebangsaan Malaysia or the National University of Malaysia for her thesis, From Conflict to Insight, a Zen-based reading procedure for the analysis of fiction. From January 2011 to March 2013, she was postdoctoral research fellow at University Putra Malaysia, focusing on Malaysian novels in English. Most of her professional life was spent in the corporate world as writer and as creative and communications consultant. She specialized in the development of strategies for advertising and promotional campaigns, corporate brand building programs, and the synergizing of corporate communication and business aims. Good morning, Guat Eng. How are you today? Morning. I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. As you know, what we are trying to do with this project is to archive history, stories, our lives, women who come from the region surrounding the South China Sea, a place that's quite contentious recently. <laughs> yes. You were born in Rumbau in Negeri mm. Sambilan, which is yes. a small little state. Perhaps for our listeners, you could share with us a little bit about how it was when you were growing up. Well, I was born in Rambau, but I didn't grow up there. What happened was I was born during the Japanese occupation. You know, the Second mm-hmm. World War and the Japanese occupation. 1943, is that right? Yeah, that was 1943. And at that time, my father was... Um, before the war, he had been working for the Malayan Railways. And perhaps because he didn't look very Chinese, the Japanese didn't think of him as being Chinese and therefore didn't chop off his head. We, we might edit that. Well, no, don't, please, because it's terribly important that people remember the atrocities that ha- that took place. Plus, it's part of our history, you know, although many, many, of course, many people would rather we forget, but I think sometimes it's worthwhile remembering history. Hmm. I think uh, I think you're right. And when when I said that, I was actually so consciously self-editing. Yes, I, and I don't think we should. Uh, we're talking about. I'm a fiction writer, you know, and I wouldn't write fiction if I wasn't very concerned about truth. But truth cannot be told in a normal way, right? Very often, because people will censor themselves and censor me. So I have to do it through fiction. And to, but to me, it's terribly important that we remember our past, our history, things that have been done to us by people, and especially if they, for the younger generation who are not aware. We, we are living in a generation of, um, there's this word, cancel, cancel culture. Exactly. So, for example, yeah. um, there there have been also some uh, great men in the past. Uh, mm. Recently, in Australia, they found out there was a street name after him. They've also found out that he was a slave driver. So, there were some people lobbying to remove his name and mm. also a plaque dedicated to him. So, well, I know, and I I have to say that I disagree. You know, with this. Uh, cancelling of one's history Mm. it is you are actually cancelling out history and nobody will remember later on in later generations I think a better option is if you actually put a plaque up that explains this person's background that counters the implicit honouring that you're doing by having this statue or name name him name you know call out this person this dead person you know yeah. say we are, this is the, the 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 statue or or whatever but this is the man and say what he did i think that's important i think that's a very very yeah. good point going and i i love the fact that you brought up 
you know, the fact that you're using fiction to actually tell fact. Well, of course, that's what fiction, well, a lot, most, many fiction writers do that, you know. Unless they're deliberately writing pure for pure enjoyment, you know, the genre writers, fine. But I suppose if you're most serious writers that I know, they're actually dealing with facts, with realities as they write fiction. But I was going to tell you about my father. He was then the head station master of this little little train stop somewhere in the southwest of the Malay Peninsula. But I don't think we we spent much time there because soon after that we moved it was then known as Port Slackner, but it's now Port Lang, where my father continued to work with the railways. So that was a job it was a job related the move. Ah yes, yes, yes. And and yes. basically the entire family went along as well. Well, of course, yes, yeah. And how old were you? I must have been an an infant. I don't remember much of it. You know, you know we had relatives around us, and um, these relatives were part of my growing up years. So we must have been there, and because an uncle. An uncle of mine who lived in Port Lang, Port Vietnam, was the one who gave me the pet name to be called. Yeah, it's a custom that many people, Malaysian Chinese like me, of Peranakan, whose uh, forefathers had lived here for many years, very British in a way, English educated, and so on. There would be a, a Chinese name on the birth certificate for official use, but at home we would be given. Malay names or English names, and they were pet names. When when you mention Malay names for our listeners as well to understand the context of growing up as um, uh, Nyonya or Peranakan, can you share that? How what does that mean to speak Malay at home? But we didn't speak Malay at home because our language was English. My father having been, my both my parents having been English educated and so on and so forth, you know. The Malaysian Chinese, the Chinese who live in Malaysia today, not all of them came during the colonial period. Many of them came before. Some, their, their descendants who now live, mean they went to Malacca. They came during the time of the Ming Dynasty, I think, sometime in the 16th century. Yeah, but my. My forefathers didn't weren't the Chinese who went to Malacca in that uh, when they came during the Ming Dynasty. My father, my my forefathers were in Thailand, and my grandfather. They must have been there for for several generations because my grandfather owned land. He owned paddy lands. Which part of Thailand is this? The southern part of Thailand, closer to Kedah? Yeah, yes, yeah. That was all part of Thailand. You know, Perlis and Kedah, Kelantan, our northeastern states up in the peninsula were part of Thai of, of Thailand, of Siam. So that called. means you were born in Rambau in Negeri Sembilan, but your your generational history goes back further further north. Yeah, yeah. Where were your parents born? No, my my father was definitely born up there, up in the north. And at that time, all that was during my grandfather's time. It was all part of Siam or Thailand. But in 1908 or so, the British um, signed a treaty with the king of Thailand of Siam. It's called the Anglo Siam Treaty. In return for lands, I think on the Burmese border, the Thai king gave up. Some parts of his land in the south, they became part of British Malaya. So when people say that we came to Malaya, we can't even say that of my family. Malaya came to us. We were there, yep. right? Understood. Part of the land and the landscape, you know. So, so yeah. So that's how uh, we, be- we became. And then, of course, for many, uh, for the those Chinese of that. Era who grew up during the British colonial period and all that, it was quite natural to send 
their children to English schools to learn English because of the British thing. Yeah, my maternal grandfather was English educated too, and he actually worked as a legal clerk in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. I understand what you mean now by basically the, the the entire family has been educated and also worked within government service. Yeah. So yeah. that's so much um, of that culture. It's it's the Malayan, the colonial English culture. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, and do you think that's possibly why you went into writing and the communication in the no. I don't think so. One of the things, of course, is that when I graduated from university, when I came back from Germany, uh, that was in the early 70s, the very English colonial, is that does that explain why I became a writer? I don't think so. You know, I mean, I'm the only member in one. My family has taken to writing, but uh, working, working in Malaysia in the early 70s, when there was a national language policy, when English had lost it, a privileged position, people like me, with a, a command of the English language, found it easy to get jobs in the private sector. That makes sense. It, it, was, it was necessity, and then it was also what you already had. You were gifted with it already. Well, yeah, I, it was part of, of me, you know. I went into advertising because it was, it was the, a job I applied for. You know, and I got it, and that's it. What were the types of campaigns you were working on then? I quite enjoyed doing a whole series of several campaigns actually for ICI paints. And nowadays, I can't even. I don't even. I I don't think it's even being sold nowadays. I think it's merged with Dulux, and Dulux has absorbed the name, just like oh, how. Oh, I see. We advertised Dulux and Pentalite. Like that, yeah, that was quite fun. Advertising that, and then I did things like Nestle's milk baby's formula. Oh no, I can't say that. To answer your question, I can't say that my being Puranakan has anything to do with becoming a writer. Perhaps because of my ethnic ambiguity, having a Chinese name, looking fairly Chinese. Of course, I've always been Malay. I got Malay or Thai great aunts and. What really made me write my first novel was that after 1969, the riot, May 13, they show up. Many of my friends who were Malaysians but ethnic Chinese were immediately planning to leave the country to emigrate. So they would apply this as well as at university and so they would be applying for scholarships to universities in Australia, Britain, um, America, you know. And the idea was that they should get that scholarship, go there, study and never come back. It was the big exodus. Yes, because I, they were kind of upset because, you know, the people who were English educated saw themselves, people of my generation, saw themselves as being entitled to elite positions. The English educated were educated by the British to be the rulers, you know, to, to be the the, the gov- government servants and so on to keep the the colonial machinery moving. And I think they were upset by the fact that they had the idea English no longer entitled them to that type of position. Honestly, I, I couldn't see, I couldn't understand why they, they thought like that. Because my Malay was no better than theirs because we didn't learn Malay We didn't speak Malay at home and we didn't learn Malay in school. But it didn't seem very reasonable to me, their argument that they now had to learn Malay, to them a foreign language. And Anna and I would say, we are, but English is also a foreign language, right? For you, you know, because they spoke Chinese at home. I said, for you, English is a foreign language, but you had no problem working with it. And so this kind of, I, I felt I didn't quite belong to the average Chinese Malaysian. I didn't feel I belong. At the same time, of course, I can't say that I am Malay either, although culturally and in many ways, I feel more comfortable when I'm with Malay people. 
or even with Indian, but I really do not feel comfortable Chinese in Malaysia. There's there's a very good way of uh, telling how you identify when you were in when you were overseas in Germany, for example. Mm. How would you introduce yourself? Let's say you are at a social event. Mm. How would you introduce yourself? Because that is usually a good telltale. Like, oh, I'm Malaysian, or I am oh. Malaysian Chinese, or I am. You know, usually, <laughs> no, Chinese no, would say I, that. I I um I just say who I am, my name, and of course, in, in Germany, for instance, very often at that time in the early seventies, not many Germans had heard of Malaysia. They didn't know about Malaysia until the Malay Malaysian football team went to play in, I think it was the Olympic Games, you know, and they were so impressed. By our, our our footballers, was that um, the Sochin An days? I don't remember. I was never interested in football, but I remember uh, one German said to me, "Oh, but these are not footballers; they're dancers because they were so graceful, you know, on the field and did so well." But uh, very often, I would have been asked if I was Japanese, and I would say no, and they will say. They ask me where I'm from, and I say Malaysia, and they were, ah, oh, Singapore. I say no, Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then they make a connection, and they say, ah, Malacca, because I think on their map, this whole region, the Malacca Straits. I suppose I'm Malaysian. You know, I don't can't say I spend a lot of time thinking about it, but generally, the feeling of being ethnically, culturally ambiguous. At the same time, I have to say this: that I love this country. I cannot see myself living in an- another country. I, I mean, I've been to other countries and I love being there, but I want to come home. It's home. Malaysia is home to me. So, this sense of of feeling that I don't quite belong to that the diaspora. I don't quite belong to the Chinese diaspora. I don't feel like my name is Chinese, you know, but I don't feel I belong there. That sense of not belonging, and and so I think it gives me an ability, I suppose, to look at them much more objectively than they can see themselves. I will say this very frankly: many of them are very racist in my eyes. Racist in that when they talk about non-Chinese, the Malay, especially Simon, I think it's more like color, color skin, skin colorist. If you were fair. If you were white, therefore you were okay. I'm talking about Chinese people here, right? Generally in Malaysia. But if you were darker skin, right? Even if you were a Chinese with a slightly darker skin, a darker complexion, if you were Malay, if you were Indian, they have no space in their lives for you. It it goes back to all of the forms that we have to fill in Malaysia until today. You have to tick. Those race boxes, which do not exist anywhere else, these boxes that you have to tick, whether you are Malay, Chinese, Indian, or Dan Lion Lion. So if yeah. if we were to fall under Dan Lion Lion, which in English it translates to others, you are not Dan Lion Lion. You would be China. You'd be ethnically Chinese. But is that the reason to look down on people who are who have darker skin? I'm sorry. I don't particularly like there are people from Malaysia who are probably of Chinese origin, and they're probably listening to this, and they will hate me for this. But I have to say because at some point it must end. This kind of unthinking prejudice must end. A lot of us from certain cultures grow up with these prejudices taught to us from from our older generation. It, yes. it trickles down. So it doesn't come from feeling forms. We have to be clear about that, right? Let's not excuse ourselves with things like that. What I was trying to get to was that they were from that generation that created those forms. I wonder why those forms were even created. Part of of governance, you know, from the British days, you had to be you you were classified into different things. I feel forms. I don't feel that way about people who have darker skin than me. 
No, I, 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 I know people of an older generation who never had to feel any forms at all, but it comes with every word they speak, it's in the water they drink. So, no, maybe a cultural thing, it may be a Chinese thing, but I, I didn't like it, shall I say, when I saw this happening around me and it became more pronounced after the racial riots. It became more pronounced. What set me quite a bit was that years later, in the 1990s, especially in the nine, early 1990s, partly I suppose because of the first Gulf War, we were doing very well economically. And these people came back. They came back to the country, not to, not to settle or anything, but to sell themselves books they had written, things that they had made, and generally all simply to earn money to then take away back to their adopted country. I'm sorry, I could be talking about people like you, Jasmine, but you asked for this. So, so I'm telling you what I feel. Why I wrote that first novel in the first place, I felt then, I saw it all as opportunism, that you will leave the country when it is in dire straits and come back when it's doing well. And I had to deal with that. I had to deal with that because many of them, these people were my friends and some of them were relative. It hurt me very much and it was out of this terrible sense of, my God, I don't even want to talk to people like you. That was how I felt mm. that I wrote my first novel. It was out of that feeling, trying to understand what is it that makes Malaysian Chinese do that. So I therefore created a Malaysian Chinese character, somebody called Lim Ailian, and sort of set the situation for her in this country where she had left the country after the 1969 riots out of fear and then come back later for personal reasons and then suddenly found herself stuck here. How does she cope with it? How do people deal with it? What is it that makes them feel that way? So that, that's what drove me to writing my novel. It was trying to answer existential questions, yes. you know, problems. You put it into a, a book of fiction. Yeah, because it's through the writing that that I work out problems. See, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a, a propagandist. You know, I don't. I don't start with when I write something. I don't have like um, a. a a theory or a thesis or a particular point of view that I want to get across. Usually I start with a question. Why are people like that? And then as I write and as the characters begin to do things on their own, react to certain situations that turn up in my imagination and it's placed before the characters as they act. And as I write their story, I, I begin to understand what makes them think. I may not like them still at the end, but I know what makes them tick. I read somewhere recently that it's the lull and the quiet that become the most productive because it allows us, you know, that that emptiness allows us to work out a lot of things. And in today's day and age with so much data, technology, content, where do we even have time to process things? So it, it's... Thank you for sharing how, how you process that anger. Mm. Was it jealousy also, do you think? A jealousy? No. Why? No, certainly not jealousy. Why would that be? Jealousy? I'm just trying to work out the emotion that you felt. Well, that's the thing that I had to work out myself. You know, it's not jealousy. It's actually, there I say this, it was actually disdain. Mm, disdain, okay. Yes. I didn't expect that emotion, but okay. Yeah. And I had to deal with it because, as I said, at home I didn't even want to talk to people like that. I didn't, I didn't want to call them my friends because, I guess, you know, I kind of love this country. I'm a patriot, you know, and to me, this is my country. And when it's in trouble, I need to be here. I need to be here to make things change. I'm not going to run away. Sorry, Jasmine, but I'm not going to run away. And you know what uh, used to irritate me a lot was that people would listen to me and they'd hear me speak English and they'd say, why are you in this country? Why haven't you emigrated? <laughs> and it's as though I am here because I can't go anywhere else. 
as though no country will accept me. And, and that, that, that's the thing as well, that many of these people who left the country felt superior. I think that's, that's, you've just hit the nail on the head possibly. Yeah, yeah. They felt, oh, you know, other countries, they're willing to they accept us and, you know, we are. And then they come back and they're trying to tell us how we should govern the country, what we should be doing and all that. And honestly, that irritates me a lot. That irritates me very much because I feel, I suppose very much as the Chinese government, the mainland Chinese government now does about the US, you know, I keep thinking, we are going to learn on our own, you know, we are going to make our own mistakes. We're going to do things our way. Don't come and tell us how to do it. Many of those who left, they have gone on what I think of it as a cruise ship. They've taken the easy way to an easy life. We are left here building our own boats. We know what kind of boats we want. We don't particularly want your cruise ship experience. You understand? So all that, it's not jealousy, it's actually disdain. Thank you. But Thank you for sharing I'm probably that. alone, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I, you have spoken something that's not been looked into much because it's just something people don't talk about. You know, we, we talk about cookies, we talk about Hari Raya, Chinese New Year, we talk about food. We, we yeah. layer our lives with so much, like a kue lapis, you know, mm. a layer cake. Mm. We, ha- we have so many layers and sometimes we don't talk about those layers. I suppose, yeah. And I suppose for many, of course, for many... Malaysian Chinese, these players, well, their roots don't go very deep. I can understand that, you know. They may have come here, that, that it may be just the grandfather at the very most who has come here, say, after the war, you know, to escape the communists in China. And they came here. So their roots are not as deep as mine, for instance. Yes. I can I can feel the sense of pride, the, the sense of Malaya or Malaysia or even Siam was your bloodland. The Semenanjung, the Isthmus of Kra, that, that entire strip. Exactly. And it's not just that, it's the whole, the whole, this Nusantara, the whole Southeast Asia. It's, we have absorbed the culture. So we are we generally amongst ourselves generally are kinder, more polite. We don't yell. Are you sure we don't yell? We don't. I, my family. But we belong to that group. So we are more Thai in our behavior than Chinese, I would say. Mm. We are more Thai or Malay, you know, like our food or whatever. You know, but also the way we speak to one another, the way we behave, the way we hold ourselves, for instance. So... There is a kind of like a distance from the diaspora Chinese, newer migrants. Yeah. So that's what it means to be Puranakan, and that's what it means to not speak Chinese at home. 